The first cube was a formula for death. Unless you cracked the code. If any of these numbers are prime, then the room is trapped. In this place, space defies reason. All the realities are starting to collapse. Time has no meaning. You think that this is just an optical illusion or something? And reality is out to get you. The fun's just beginning. It's only a matter of time. We are definitely not alone. Come in. Come in. I refuse to die here. Cube. There are no rules. Hi, welcome to To the 90s and Beyond, the film podcast that looks at movies, of course, of the 1990s as well as newer films that spun off of those films from the 1990s, whether they're sequels or prequels or remakes or what have you, somehow tying into those films that originated in the 1990s. My name is Vince Leo. I've been doing film reviews since the 1990s, 1996 to be exact, and you can find all of my written work at my website. That's quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. Why you happen to be on that site, there is a link that goes to my other podcast. If you like what you hear here, and you also happen to be a fan of films in the 1980s, I do a film podcast covering that decade as well called Around the World in 80s Movies. Find that link at my website, quipster.net. Today, I'm going to be getting into the second part of this four-part series looking at the Cube films. The original Cube came out in the 1990s, but the sequels or the prequels, or the remakes, because there is one of each, came out beyond that. So this is the beyond section of To the 90s and Beyond. Cube 2, Hyper Cube, came out in 2002. It's an R-rated film. It does have language, some violence, brief nudity. The runtime is 94 minutes, or an hour and 34 minutes. Carrie Matchett, Geraint Wynne Davies, Gracelyn Kung, Matthew Ferguson, Neil Crone, and Barbara Gordon appear in the film. Andre Sekula is the director of the screenplay credited to Sean Hood, Ernie Barbarish, and Lauren McLaughlin. Now, shortly after the international success of 1997's science fiction thriller called Cube, which we talked about on the previous episode, its writer, director, producer, creator, Vincenzo Natali, he received an offer from the Sci-Fi Channel to do a TV movie based off of that original concept, kind of a continuation, so to speak. Natali concocted this vague concept, but he felt it worked better as an ongoing series. The movie could be the pilot to that series. It would explain that the cube structure that we were introduced to in the theatrical film was merely a bridge that connects distinct environments that are also structured very much like puzzles. And the travelers through this puzzle realm would have to solve its puzzle before advancing to the next one, to the next environment. An emerging plot line that would go through the series would reveal that the main character who would be portrayed by David Hewlett, who played Worth in the first film, that he is the one who built this realm. Unfortunately, Natalie declined the project because the sci-fi channel would not commit to making it an ongoing series. They wanted to see how the TV movie did. And so he decided it was probably better to just let it lie. About a year later or so, in 2000, Lionsgate acquired Trimark Pictures, and that included the rights to all of those Trimark properties. Some of those properties were deemed to have some sort of remake or sequel potential, and that included Cube. Lionsgate decided they were going to contact Natalie about a sequel, but this time he declined doing a sequel outright. He stated that he really thought about it. He disliked most sequels. Cube was also not a very easy story to continue because of the themes that are there that pose questions. It's not necessarily about getting answers. He also remembered that making Cube entirely in the small room, it was so grueling that he really didn't want to repeat the torturous experience of doing that again, especially since he felt he had done pretty much all there was to do with the original story. And next, Cube co-creator Andre Bajelic, Natali's near lifelong friend who 
helped him with the screenplay to Cube. He took a conference call with Lionsgate, and he mentioned that he did have a backburner idea for a sequel, and it would involve the architect character named Worth, again, played by David Hewlett. He would awaken in a hospital, apparently having miraculously survived his apparent murder from the first film. Somehow he was just severely injured. But Worth, when he wakes up in that hospital, he has no idea how he got there. And he really can't tell anybody about the ordeal he had that landed him there because he feels that nobody is going to believe him. What's more than this, he finds that he's not living the life that he thought he had led before he went into the cube. He now has a different life than he had before. He has a different apartment. He has this gorgeous girlfriend, a mysterious one, he feels he'd never met before. He also has a bank account containing a wealth of money. Now, this new life seems ideal, but Worth feels it's really not his to lead, and he starts growing determined to learn who is behind setting all this up. And the clues to that lead to this Kafka-esque mystery thriller notion. Now, Bajelik's ideas, they didn't quite match the expectations of the Lionsgate executives. Lionsgate felt that audiences wanted another film within a cube. This premise should be repeated. Instead of following the further story of one of the characters from the first film, they wanted to see more cube. They didn't want to see more worth. And so they dropped that idea. Shortly afterward, in-house Cinepix producer, Cinepix being the forerunner, to Lionsgate, Ernie Barbarish, who was more of a kind of a free agent at this point working with Lionsgate, he was offered several potential projects that he could put into production following this TriStar acquisition. And among the new properties that he had to choose from, he immediately locked into the sequel to Cube. Barbarish was a major fan of the first film, so Lionsgate greenlit this sequel under the care of director of development Alex Sanger, as well as Barbarish as the producer. Cube 2, the sequel, would be made for a budget just a little bit more than the first effort. The shooting days were just a little bit more than the first effort, too. 24 total days covering, you know, 31-day span, 24 working days. During the summer of 2001, when it was released, it was going to be screened at Cannes, try to shop around the foreign film market. And within a few days of its being greenlit, Lionsgate entered into deals with foreign entities like Tokyo-based Presidio Corporation for Japanese distribution rights and rights to other Lionsgate titles. And then they sealed other deals in geographical locations where the first film happened to do very well financially. That included places in Europe and Asia and South America. And because Cube had become a cult favorite when it hit home video in North America, it was considered potentially a theatrical release in North America right up until the end of post-production. In the end, though, they decided that it would work better as a director video release in the United States and Canada, even though it would play theatrically most other places in the world. The screenplay duties for Cube 2 were handed to Halloween Resurrections co-scribe Sean Hood. Hood was considered desirable here because he had a, an educational background that included majoring in pure mathematics. And if you've watched Cube, you know that mathematics is a very big part of the plot's underpinnings. And Hood saw his goal to create a new environment within this Cube maze idea, new developments that we were going to follow, and new problems to solve. He wanted to make it unique, and so he decided he was going to bring in something extra some quantum physics ideas. The cube would be more than just a three-dimensional place. It was now a four-dimensional environment based on real mathematical and scientific concepts that included such things as parallel dimensions and time shifts, changes in speed, changes in gravity as you travel from room to room. And this new cube, this new cube structure is based on the concept of a tesseract, a tesseract being the four-dimensional analog for a cube. Essentially, normal laws of physics don't necessarily apply while you're in the tesseract structure. Due to the time shifting and alternate dimensions, character deaths may not be permanent. We see certain goners in this film come back time and time again. Hood script featured eight new characters who find themselves within this strange structure comprised of cube-shaped rooms, very familiar if you've seen the first film, and they also, just like the first film, connect to each other through these portals at the center of every side. 
What's different is as the characters traversed from room to room, they discover they seem to be moving into different nonlinear configurations. And eventually they discover that they're not really in this three-dimensional environment. They happen to be in one that has four dimensions. And that means that what they see and what they hear might be coming from a different time in the past or in the future. So making it out of this cube maze requires deciphering how to make it to the end room for each configuration while avoiding traps or re-entering rooms that they'd already been inside. These traps include such things as the razor sphere and the cube of light and these time gears, all of these things that might crush you or slice you in some way. And these characters begin to surmise that one of the eight people was likely going to get killed in each of the sets of cube formations, and only one of them probably was going to get out alive. Now, because of the heady quantum physics that is involved in Hood's script, each page of his original 100-page screenplay contained descriptive illustrations on the back of the page to allow the reader of the script a visualization so that they could get a better understanding of the concepts that were going on at the time. It was really hard to imagine from the script just what was going on. I happened to read the full script, and I didn't have those illustrations. It was somewhat hard to decipher. Now, for the director, they decided to hire someone with know-how in overcoming many challenges to the way that you would photograph within this cube environment. They soon secured veteran cinematographer Andre Sekula. Sekula had worked for them on American Psycho, but more than that, he was known primarily as the cinematographer for Quentin Tarantino's earlier works, including Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. So someone definitely who was sought after. Sekula could also handle the chores here of the director. This would be his first directorial effort on top of being the cinematographer. And Sekula knew that Cube 2 was probably going to be one of the most challenging things he'd ever tried to make. So it was something different. He was up to the challenge, but also the premise happened to tickle his imagination to the point where he had many ideas of his own that he wanted to incorporate that were different from what was in the script. Sekula pushed to try to shoot the film in a bigger widescreen format like Cinemascope or Super 35. The budget was just not going to allow for that kind of film stock. Anything beyond the standard full frame 35 millimeter was just not going to work. Sekula wanted, in particular, identical all-white rooms. That was something that Natali wanted to do in the first film, but then he was convinced to do color rooms. But Sekula wanted to go back to that original idea of all-white rooms because he felt that that would increase this feeling of confusion among the characters to go from room to room and not know which room that they were in based on colors. And more than this, the cube rooms had to be something that could be easily replicated into this photorealistic virtual cube that they were going to create using computers. So that reality of shooting in the real cube could be blended seamlessly with these CG room effects. And that would help them to utilize camera angles and movements that could not be done through conventional means. They would use the virtual camera within a virtual cube that would seamlessly blend through movie magic, of course, with the real footage. And this would also work kind of like for the thematic elements of the eeriness of the story, because making this cube a place that would look like it could have been a simulation made by a computer or perhaps something imaginary, a world without shadows, but many reflections, that would kind of echo some of the themes that were going on in the film. This would be a world both free and a slave to the concept of time and place. Sekula began requesting changes to Hood's screenplay to meet with some of his ideas, primarily due to some of the logistic and budgetary considerations that were in mind. In particular, he wanted many of Hood's traps from the original script to represent cubes instead of these circular saws or time gears. He wanted to go with that cube motif throughout the entire film. Because this had to be done in a hurry and on the spot, the script revisions were taken up by the producer of Cube 2, Ernie Barbrush, as well as Lauren McLaughlin, who happened to be a, a fellow Cinepix colleague of Barbarish, who became a Lionsgate production executive. And McLaughlin happened to have prior screenwriting experience. She did low-budget efforts like 1996's Specimen, as well as 1999's Prisoner of Love, which Barbarish happened to co-produce with McLaughlin. Barbarish and McLaughlin did a complete overhaul of Hood's script, including changing all of the names, all of the traits of those original characters. They incorporated a backstory here to explain more of the cube's existence as kind of a byproduct 
of experiments that were being done within this military industrial complex, specifically a major weapons manufacturer. So they made a cursory attempt to try to tie the events of the first Cube film. They introduced this uh, colonel, a military type, who was in charge of creation of the first Cube prison, and he finds himself now a prisoner in this new Cube structure. The colonel is looking for numbers on the wall they, as they had been written by the characters in the prior film. He soon finds that this is a new structure, so therefore no writing on the wall, and it happens to be much more advanced in its design. However, Barbarish knew that the strength of Natali's original happened to be in generating philosophical questions instead of providing all of these pat answers. So he felt that this follow-up should additionally continue that tradition, providing a few possible answers here and there. But people, the viewers, should also leave Cube 2, like the first film, wondering about some of the deeper things that are not as easily answered. They chose to make one of the characters a young blind woman. This would seem like she would be a liability to the others, very much like Kazan from the first film. Later, it would be revealed that Sasha happens to be the most powerful among them. In an early version of the script, Sasha would be revealed as an android, but they decided to either change their opinion to make her human or maybe just not reveal that she's an android, at least not in this entry. Production designer Diana Magnus, she worked on the original Cube. She was the art director on the first film. As with Cube, they could only afford on Cube 2 to build one full 17 by 17 by 17 cube. And through the portal, you would see three walls of a half cube visible through the doors. Magnus designed the structure using these translucent plexiglass plates attached to an aluminum frame. And the cube was set up in this studio on the east end of Toronto. A photorealistic version of the cube was also digitally created by Mr. X's Toronto-based animation studio so it could be blended as this photographic double with the practical and live action shots using green screen technology, and that would allow for virtual cameras that could be used to do otherwise difficult or impossible shots from any angle using any movement desired within the computer software. Mr. X did over 150 effect shots this way, which were key in pre-production in implementing how the story was going to play out. And depending on what they were able to achieve visually using the computers, as well as economically, they came up with an interesting concept. Barbarish and McLaughlin would revise their script to try to incorporate its use. Scenes and situations were also altered during post-production when the notion of what the hypercube's nature was beginning to change. It was still in play as they started to play around with editing. Cube 2 Hypercube, it begins with this dialogue-free overhead shot of what appears to be sedated humans who were under plastic wrappings and they happen to be wheeled in on gurneys, rolling toward a destination that we assume will be the cube structure. This shot was originally meant for a flashback that would be in the middle of the film, but Barbarish, during the editing, wanted a more interesting way to hook viewers into this mystery, and he decided to make that shot the prologue. The hypercube would seem to be growing increasingly unstable as all of these time differentials and multiple dimensions begin to collide, especially as we get toward the end. They originally wanted an ending where people turned into mercury shapes, but it happened to be too complicated to do, even with their technology, with the time and resources available. So they decided instead that the hypercube would collapse upon itself and devolve into a giant pool of mercury. Over 2,000 seven foot light tubes would be placed around the exterior of the cube to light the interior, but that obviously was going to make things grow very hot. So they used a lot of air conditioning, but the air conditioning wasn't always working properly. So it was kind of a difficult shoot at times. The light happened to also be so blinding within the cube at full lighting that many of the actors decided to wear sunglasses, at least up until they did their take. And even then it was difficult to try to act without squinting at that point. Some of the cube panels happened to be removable, including the lights so they could put in cameras from the side and shoot at certain angles as if they were, you know, standing on, at the side of the wall. Large fans were also used to try to dissipate a lot of that heat, but the fans were so loud that many sound effects had to be looped in post-production because the sound was always there. Secula tried not to really push the actors too hard, knowing that this was a difficult shoot. He was concerned that being in this very small and confined space flooded with light for hours was going to make them feel kind of 
queasy or uneasy or maybe even result in epileptic fits or nervous breakdowns if they were in there too long. And despite all of that, the actors still felt that they had a good time. They became good friends during the shoot. They would joke around to pass the time as they were setting up for each scene. Following that opening intro with the gurney, we get this elaborate animated title sequence that foreshadows a lot of the story's multi-dimensional underpinnings, going from one dimension to two dimension to three dimension to four dimension. We do briefly meet a character after that animated title sequence who gets quickly dispatched, this woman who will reappear again sometime during the middle of the film for reasons that probably would be a spoiler for me to go into fully. Then we're introduced to the main body of characters one by one, and they begin forming this team, trying to decipher together their predicament, as well as how they are going to find a way out of this seeming maze of cube rooms that they've awakened in. This group of eight strangers are transported into a maze of cube rooms for unknown reasons. They try to make their escape. Unlike the first cube, this group discovers that there is actually a thread by which they were chosen for their involuntary participation in this maze prison and what their connection is to each other. And while explanations do happen to be there, it does ditch the hook of the first film as a form of allegory in, in doing so. So it's not quite as deeply philosophical as the first film, but it definitely does nerd out a lot more on mathematics. Composer Norman Orenstein used various metal pieces and serving bowls for many of the repetitive sounds that you hear within the cube. The goal was to make the score seem otherworldly, something like from another dimension instead of this traditional orchestral score. Cube 2 was mixed at Deluxe Studios, and coincidentally, Vincenzo Natali happened to be at Deluxe Studios just down the hall working on another film of his called Cypher, aka Company Man. Natali was very kind when he met those that he met on the Cube 2 set, and he was very interested in what they were doing with the sequel, but he decided that he was not going to get involved. He wasn't going to make suggestions. He didn't even stop by to take a look. Cube 2 Hypercube, when it was finally released theatrically in some international markets where the first film did well, it did actually well again. It took in over a million dollars in both France and South Korea. And if you go by Box Office Mojo, it took in nearly $4 million in international markets altogether. As I mentioned, it did get straight to video basically in the United States and Canada, although it did do well for those people who were big Cube fans. As far as what I think about Cube 2, well, I think it has a few interesting ideas. It doesn't really have the intriguingly enigmatic qualities of the original film. I think the discovery of the original film really propels a lot of your interest in what's going on. I actually watched it twice for the purpose of this review to try to figure out what it's about because it was it seemed a little elusive to me the first time. And I have to say that my second time through, I happened to enjoy it a little bit less. So it kind of went down in my estimation with the repeat viewings because I felt like a lot of the flaws really started to come out for me. There really isn't much about this group of people, these characters that helped them survive this ordeal. There's some sort of military experiment at play, the nature of which is is still pretty enigmatic by the end of the story, even though you do see something outside of the cube. It, it gives you more questions rather than gives you more answers. There are booby traps here. I think people will be engaged by a few booby traps that give the appearance of perpetual danger. They're pretty rife with CG elements. It does look like you're in a video game much more so than reality. So also continuity for this film happens to be a little bit sloppy, maybe because it was rushed to production. And so you're left with having very little confidence that this very complex plot is completely fully thought out in every detail, which in a film that really offers very little except for this plot to follow means that there's not a lot of reward in trying to invest all of your time in trying to understand it all through repeat viewings because you're not completely sure. It does make sense if you wanted to piece it together. The characters are pretty sketchy. I don't find any of the characters in this film particularly likable to follow either, which is kind of a detriment as well. Barbarish has admitted publicly that he does consider Cube 2 to be a disappointment to him personally. He did love Sean Hood's original script. He wanted to shoot it as it was, but he felt that there really wasn't a way to 
represent many of its visual concepts on the limited budget that they had, so he felt he had to rewrite it for what they could afford. Although I'm not sure how much credence to lend to that because he did completely change the nature of the characters and including all of their names as well. So it was almost a complete rewrite, even if he enjoyed Sean Hood's script. Barbesh says in his defense that he wrote it in only nine days. He happened to be on vacation at the time because he was scheduled to work on another film for Lionsgate. So he really didn't have a lot of time to really flesh out all of these heady concepts and he needed more time but they really could not postpone the shoot to get it all ready. He does say that he's happy with Cube 2, the way that turned out in terms of the visuals, which are very slick. He does feel ultimately it's going to be considered a letdown by many people because of its lack of compelling and cohesive storyline. And he blames himself. He does acknowledge that Vincenzo Natale and Cube fans did deserve a better effort. As far as how Vincenzo Natale feels about the sequel, well, he feels... In fairness, he doesn't really discuss outright the quality or any of the problems he has with the sequels, but he does say that he does feel sorry for anybody who tries to make a Cube sequel. It's not easy to do. He feels that his films tend to end ambiguously. If you look throughout his career, he likes to wrestle with questions for the audience to ponder, and he feels that sequels have to push toward explaining those ambiguities that you tried to bring forward in the first film. Natali, though, also expressed that he did have some regret that he did not stay involved in some fashion in the Cube sequels because he he feels that a lot of Cube's fans also start asking him questions about the Cube sequels because they assume that he actually did them, or if he didn't do them, that he had some input as to how they were made, and he would continue to get questions about them, to which he would politely claim no knowledge or ownership of the sequels. However, he does acknowledge that others happen to bring a freshness to the material that who he would not have been able to do if he were pushing forward with the sequel. So all in all, Cube 2, a very flawed film in a lot of respects. It's respectable in what they were trying to do. I think that if you're really into these heady, you know, quantum physics ideas, you'll probably get more mileage than most viewers. For that, I can only give Cube 2, Hypercube, two stars out of four. And two stars on my scale means that I do think that it's lacking something vital that would keep it from being a recommendable movie for most people. That which it's lacking here happens to be that compelling story, those interesting characters for us to follow to keep us rooted in where it's going to go ultimately and there would be a payoff at the end i don't feel like there is this big payoff and i don't feel like the questions that it has to wrestle with are nearly as interesting or compelling as natalie's first cube even with some better production values here probably more consistent acting etc so qualitatively it might be better in terms of bells and whistles but at its core i do think that cube the first cube is a better film. So two stars is the best I can give. Cube 2 Hypercube. Now after the release of Hypercube, Lionsgate did mull over making another sequel called Cube 3. Barbarish would go on to produce, write, and direct this, but made it a Cube prequel instead called Cube Zero. And he said that it was his attempt to do a Cube film the right way. And that's what I'm going to be talking about, of course on the next episode so check out cube zero if you happen to watch the first cube and cube two and you'll better understand what i talk about during that review now as far as cube two just one more thing to say there is an alternate ending that is included on the dvd that does reveal a little bit more about the group running the experiment it's a little more revelatory if you want that sort of thing if you don't then it's optional whether you should watch it so I hope that you enjoyed this look at Cube 2 Hypercube if you have your own thoughts on this. And I know that there are some people who actually do like Cube 2. If you want to reveal why you think it's actually tightly plotted and it makes a lot of sense or maybe some things that I did not discuss during this review or retrospective that maybe I should have shed some light on, you can reach out to me. You can find my contact information at my website. That's at quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. And until we get into Cube Zero, the prequel to Cube, on the next episode, thank you everyone for joining me as we continue to travel to the 90s and beyond.